It can happen in an instant. I couldn't even see my hand because all the skin had just melted off like a candle. And I heard her scream and she was just holding her hand. And there was like big bubbles on it. These injuries redefine the meaning of trauma. Survival is never guaranteed. We'll have to watch very closely over the next 24 hours to make sure that he lives through this. But there is a place where science fights suffering and more often than not, wins. You can't run a big, a busy burn center without having a good supply of skin. It is called the burn center, and these are its stories. You can't work on a service like this very long without seeing some miracles. Burn patients face countless operations, grueling physical therapy, and emotional trauma. Burn injury is devastating to the body just because it affects so many different systems and it isn't just the fact that the skin is affected, all the organs can be affected. The burn injury is a lifelong injury, it never totally goes away. An elite group of medical specialists offer patients the very best in modern technology and burn care. Every year, about 51,000 Americans are hospitalized for burn treatment, and nearly 5,500 of them die from their devastating injuries. At the University of California, San Diego Regional Burn Center, an average of nearly 400 people are admitted yearly for burn injuries and smoke inhalation. age 44 has just been admitted to University of California San Diego's Regional Burn Center Trauma Recess Room. He set himself on fire in a bizarre accident while lighting a cigarette in the back seat of a taxi cab with the windows open. The cab driver used a fire extinguisher to put out the fire. So when this patient arrived, he was able to speak to us, but was complaining of a lot of shortness of breath. And it was very evident from the degree of the burns to his chest and his neck that he would not be able to support his airway for long. Because Mr. Granger's body will swell dramatically in response to the burn injury, his airway could close. To ensure that this airway remains open, he's immediately intubated. A tube is placed down his throat into his trachea. A respirator then helps him breathe. Next, the doctors and nurses need to determine the extent of Mr. Granger's injuries. To do this, they will measure the percentage of burn covering his body. Well, just for a quick layman's term, we have a whole calculation what we use at the hospital. We just want a quick check when they come in. We use the patient's hand. Not my hand for a patient, it's their hand. So a baby comes in, we use their hand. And their little palm is 1% burn. And that's how we can do a quick palm read and decide how big it is and we'll get to the treatment as quick as we can. Along with calculating the percentage of the body damaged, the medical team needs to assess the degree of the burns. Well, the first degree burn is just a, a very light burn of the upper epidermis, which is uh, commonly caused by a sunburn. Patients don't get sick unless it covers their entire body. A second degree burn burns through two top layers of skin, the epidermis and dermis. The skin will also blister. A third degree burn is by far the most dangerous type. The top two layers of skin and fatty tissue beneath, which cover the muscles, are burned, leaving the area entirely unprotected. The medical team determines that Mr. Granger has second and third degree burns covering over 40% of his body. After intubating him, he is given a cocktail of drugs called paralytics. They will place him into a medically induced coma. 
Well, it helps with pain. We want them to have a decreased sensation of pain, and we just want them to basically be asleep. Now, the paralytics are basically used for patients that have a compromised airway so that their airway might be so swollen that we don't want them to cough their tube out because then it's very difficult to get the tube back in. Overnight, the patient has been very critical. He has required massive amounts of fluid. He's received over 15 liters of hypertonic saline in order to try to fluid resuscitate him. Burn patients are immediately given fluid through an IV to help keep their kidneys working. The burn causes them to lose massive amounts of bodily fluid. If they are not rehydrated, kidney failure will occur and the patient will ultimately die. Here we really... Stand, come on over here, we'll do this. Overnight, Mr. Granger's body has gone through a devastating and dramatic transformation. His body has swollen to nearly double its size. When a burn patient first comes in, sometimes, I mean, they will look fine, but within that first 12 to 72 hours, the swelling that goes on for a burn patient is phenomenal. They will swell so bad that a lot of times they aren't even identifiable. We'll have family members that will have seen them on admission and then maybe won't see them until the next day. And it can be pretty devastating. He's gonna have a lot of fluid changes that we'll have to watch very closely over the next 24 hours to make sure that he lives through this. He's, he's got a lot of swelling. He looks like venous congestion of the face. In one respect, Mr. Granger is fortunate because he is being treated at one of the world's finest burn care facilities. The University of California at San Diego Regional Burn Center has served the public for over 25 years. This burn center services the seventh largest city in the country and is world renowned for its leading edge research and teaching. The burn center uses a team approach to patient care. You just can't run a burn unit just being one person or two people. It really is a team approach. It's all the decisions the doctors make, but then there's the nurses that carry through the treatment plan, the, the therapists, the, the nutritionists, even the social workers. They work with the families and, and keep the families in there and tell them what to expect. So it really is a tremendous effort which is really required to give first-rate care, and, and I think that's what sets us off as being really unique in this hospital. The UCSD Regional Burn Center is one of only two burn centers in the entire world that employs a burn survivor. At the age of six, I sustained an 85% third-degree burns and from a propane explosion in our home, and um, I actually was in the hospital for nine months. Inspired by the care she received as a child, Cindy Rudder insists on giving back to the burn community, even though her work takes an emotional toll. Yours, eventually the color will fade out, okay, but again, it's real important that you utilize and use your hand. I feel that I lend um, just my own personal experience to a burn patient, but they also can see that in spite of the fact that I did sustain a burn injury, that I've gone on with my life, I basically have accomplished almost everything I've set my mind to, and I think that it gives them the understanding that they could do whatever they set their mind to as well. Cindy's youngest patient is Amy Rusticus, a precocious two-and-a-half-year-old child who gave herself a severe electrical burn when she disassembled a lamp after being sent to her bedroom alone as punishment for misbehaving. I heard her scream and I thought that she was just crying because she was in timeout and then I heard her scream like she was hurt and I went running in there and she was just holding her hand and there was like big bubbles on it and I ran and I put her her hand under water I didn't know what to do for a burn. Electrical burns are different than burns from a heat source because the injury continues beyond the point of contact as the electricity flows through the body. Electrical burns tend to evolve over several days, which make them difficult to treat because the full extent of the injury cannot be seen immediately. When you get burnt, like if you touch an iron, it stops. Electrical burns keep burning, they keep attacking blood vessels and skin and tissue and it can get in a blood vessel and go down into your arm and mess up your arm. 
they don't know if she'll have any function in her thumb. When I came in here, I thought they were going to put cream or something on, wrap it up, and we were going to get to go home. They said we were going to stay the night surgery the next day. And I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. My husband was gone. He's in the military. Hospital officials were able to contact Amy's father. Robert Rusticus was given special permission by the Navy to come home to his family during Amy's hospitalization. In the meantime, Amy had to undergo several operations to clean out the dead tissue on her palm. The most recent operation, called a flap graft, was needed because the tissue on Amy's hand was damaged right down to the bone. The intricate surgery entails attaching Amy's damaged palm to her groin area. This allows her hand to receive a blood supply, helping to regenerate nerves and tissue. So this is a flap. They pull the skin and then pull the flap over to form new tissue because she doesn't have anything for a skin graft to attach to. Since she's down to her tendons, right here it's bone. So they have to have something for it to attach to. Jody's husband is on the way to the hospital, and in the meantime, Jody has to deal with her feelings of guilt about her daughter's accident. I felt like it was my fault. If I wouldn't have left the room, then it wouldn't have happened. He's on IMB rate of uh, 10. Three men are brought in overnight. They were stripping the floor of a restaurant using gasoline. Although it is a widespread practice, it is very dangerous. A spark from an unknown source ignited the fuel, and a flash fire ensued. They each suffered serious second and third degree burns, which will require several months of care at the burn center. It was pretty much chaotic last night. It'll continue to be pretty chaotic today just until they're stabilized, their dressings are done, their wounds are completely assessed. So it'll be pretty hectic. And today's also an OR day, so the docs will be in the operating room back and forth between the OR and the ICU to assess the patients. 1585 out. He's net positive, The eight bed intensive care unit is overflowing, something that hasn't happened in nearly two years. We were all cleaning together. We're all cleaning together. All right. Good floor. Be very busy. Today. The chaos is physically and emotionally draining. Yeah. Patients who are ready to leave ICU are being moved as fast as possible to the step down unit, also part of the burn center. The step down unit is where non critical burn victims are treated until they are ready to be released. The bed shuffle right now is that the burn ICU is full, the burn special care is full, and we're having to move some patients because we actually have a burn patient that is down in the surgical ICU that needs to come up to the burn ICU. And so we're moving patients around that can actually leave the ICU to be able to bring in the new admits. It's the new guy. Adding to the chaos is the ongoing search to find Paul Granger's family and notify them that he is critically injured. He may not make it through the next 24 hours. Hi, is Mrs. Granger there, please? And it's Cindy Rudder's job to track down the nearest relatives. Uh, is this Rachel? Hi, do you know where I could reach her by chance? Unable to locate his immediate family, Cindy Rutter leaves a message hoping it will be passed on in time for the family to see Mr. Granger before it's too late. He is in critical condition, so I do need her to call me as soon as possible. California at San Diego's burn center faces yet another crisis. Three months ago, Peperoni de Leon, a Philippine national, accidentally set himself and another man on fire while lighting a barbecue grill on the deck of a cargo ship. The vessel was located 520 miles southwest of San Diego. Sometime Saturday, two of them had gotten hurt. Uh, I guess they threw their hands up and got their, mainly their hands, arms, and face got three uh, first degree burns and then second degree burns on, on the rest of their body. 
The incredibly dangerous rescue required the Air Force, the Navy, and the Coast Guard to coordinate their efforts and work together over three days following the accident. The Coast Guard helicopter flew 300 miles to a Navy ship, where it refueled, and then flew on to the Champion, the boat where the men were injured. They picked up the two men and brought them on board the helicopter and flew back to the Navy ship where the helicopter again refueled. 72 hours after the accident occurred, the helicopter carrying the patients landed in San Diego. The two men were then transported by ambulance to the University of California San Diego Burn Center. The medical team determined that Mr. De Leon has second and third degree burns over 80% of his body. This means he has a slim chance of survival. After 30 days, his friend was released from the hospital and returned home to the Philippines. But after 55 days, Mr. De Leon remains in the intensive care unit. Most patients, like Mr. De Leon, who are severely burned, need to have skin grafts. Probably the most important advance in burn treatment was the uh, surgical treatment of burns, in which we go in and we surgically remove the dead tissue. But it was found that you had to cover the wounds uh, with skin or something similar to skin. Skin protects the human body from the ultraviolet rays of the sun and from infection. It also helps balance the bodily fluids. Without our skin, we are susceptible to germs and infection. If the patient has undamaged skin on their body, the healthy skin is taken using a dermatome, which is a skin cutting instrument. The healthy skin is then applied to the damaged area. But in severe cases like Mr. De Leon, this is difficult due to the limited amounts of undamaged skin. If the patient had a very large injury, they had to be treated with a good substitute for skin, and the best substitute was found to be cadaver skin. The UCSD Regional Burn Center utilizes approximately 420 square feet of donated cadaver skin per year. It is a massive amount of tissue and is essential in the treatment of burn patients. You can't run a big, a busy burn center without having a good supply of skin and about the only way to do that is to have your own tissue bank. Procuring tissue for the tissue bank is a difficult and unsettling task. Families considering donating organs of their recently deceased loved ones are often reluctant to donate the skin. Asking people to donate skin involves clearing up some urban myths. Skin donation does not affect any kind of open casket funeral if the family was interested in that because the skin is only recovered from the legs and the back. Burn patients often require multiple skin graft operations because the donated skin from cadavers is useful for only a short amount of time. This donated tissue helps the wound bed heal. Once that happens, the damaged area is ready to have the patient's own skin as a graft. This then becomes permanent skin. Donor skin is a temporary biological dressing, and it eventually is sloughed off. Um, oftentimes, they'll have to go in, take this burn victim into the operating room um, at several different occasions. After 20 skin grafts, Mr. De Leon's condition is stable. However, he will need many more skin graft operations in order to heal. Because his family lives in the Philippines, they have been unable to travel to San Diego to visit with him. Mr. De Leon's only visitor is a local Catholic priest. It's um, Holy Thursday. We're coming up to the feast of Easter. You're in my prayers and the prayers of my entire community back at St. Agnes. Any family called? No. Hi, Mrs. Granger. Nearly 16 hours after Paul Granger has been admitted to the Burn Center ICU, Cindy Rudder is successful in tracking down his family. Um, your son Paul was admitted to the burn unit last night and um, is actually in critical condition. And she was upset. You can tell she's pretty distraught. 
Mr. Granger's body has swollen to a crisis point. If the pressure isn't relieved, he may die before his family arrives. Dr. Hansbro and three of his interns must perform an emergency escherotomy. Bicrochromic or Dexon, 3020, any of the above. Escherotomies are required when swelling results from a burn to a large area. Mr. Granger's arms, chest, and neck are swelling greatly due to the burn. When this happens, breathing becomes very difficult because of the constriction in the chest. The swelling can cause a patient to lose their extremities because it constricts blood flow. Using a laser, the doctors slice incisions in the swollen flesh, allowing it to open and release fluids. This will cause further scarring, but it gives Mr. Granger a better shot at survival. That should do it, Stan. Now Dr. Hansbro and his team are racing off to another operating room, where they face a grueling round of surgeries that will keep them in the operating room for nearly 10 hours straight on multiple burn patients. There is some good news. Amy's father has arrived, but much to the dismay of Amy's plastic surgeon and her parents, she has mysteriously detached her skin flap graft. No one knows for sure how Amy detached her graft, which was placed in a splint to prevent her from further damaging it. I think it's a combination of things. First of all, she had some inflammation, kind of a diaper rash that was developing in the area, which makes sense. The flap that we're working on is from the groin area. So the other thing is that she's really two, almost three years old, and even though we had her casted and splinted in uh, real nicely, it's hard to control a two-year-old. Amy is a lucky girl. Her young skin had already healed significantly before she detached her flap. So I think we're going to have a great opportunity to just take a skin graft and to cover that new healthy tissue because I can't see the nerve anymore. I can't see any of the underlying structures and uh, hopefully she'll do very well. Dr. Tenenhaus will use Amy's own skin, left over from her flap graft, to cover up the wound on her hand. What we're going to do is figure out how much skin we need right now. So we just make a little template. It gives us an idea of what we have available, what we'll need. And you can see it's just incredible, but a young person's skin is so elastic. It just stretches. Good. It looks nice. I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think it went real well. A nice skin graft, didn't have to add any other scars to this little girl. And uh, if things are doing well, then hopefully we can send her home. And we'll follow along with her. But uh, I'm, I'm really hoping for good things here. Dr. Tenenhaus is off to see another patient. And Amy's parents breathe a big sigh of relief. Who signed it? A few days later, Amy is finally released after being hospitalized for a total of 27 days. Back at the Burn ICU, Garrett Davis, a 20-year-old carpenter who learned his craft on the job with his father, Ken Davis, has come to visit him. Ken Davis has sustained 40% second and third degree burns. He uh, was installing a stove. The uh, house, it's a little trailer house, and uh, it filled up with propane. Approximately five gallons of propane was in the house, and uh, we don't know exactly how the ignition of the fire started. Somehow it did, and it got him the third degree burns down low. Before his burn, Ken Davis was an avid sportsman and very active. For Garrett, seeing his father injured and in a medically induced coma from paralytic drugs is very difficult. I'm usually uh, leaning on my father. I guess it's my turn to let him lean in. He's such a strong-willed person that uh, he's not going to let it bring him down. He'll be back like normal, and uh, we'll be building houses together willpower, strong willpower, so he'll get through this all right, I think.
This program contains some actual surgical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Five weeks after being severely burned in the back of a taxi cab, Paul Granger is still in critical condition at the UCSD burn center. His family is praying that his condition will soon improve. It's putting a heating lamp on him. Mr. Granger's temperature is dropping again. He's been having problems with hypothermia. Because 40% of his skin has been damaged by second and third degree burns, Mr. Granger's body is having a difficult time regulating temperature. He's hanging in there. Just his temperature is his biggest issue, I'd say. Um, he's got good family support, which is important. On your count, George. One, two, three. Later that day, Mr. Granger is taken down to the OR for more skin grafts. His wife, Becky Granger, is waiting for him in his empty room. The day I came up here and they had stopped the medication and it kept him paralyzed the night before so that he could open his eyes. This is the first time in two weeks that he'd been able to open his eyes. I called his name and he blinked his eyes open and I was really anxious. For and at one point when I was talking to him, his eyes focused right at me and he smiled. Okay, it isn't the same face, but it was the same smile, this funny little crooked smile. and. He looked right at me and I thought, God, it was, it was really great. And I went out of here just in the best mood in the whole world because Paul smiled at me. Small victories give Becky Granger hope that her husband will survive. Garrett's father, Ken Davis, is slowly improving. He has benefited from the use of Transite, a temporary skin covering that was developed with the assistance of Dr. Hansbrough. Well, Transite is a biologic uh, skin replacement, which actually we developed here in our laboratories. And this is composed of human uh, fibroblasts, which is a cell of the dermal layer of the skin, which we culture in a special dressing. And this was designed to be a replacement for cadaver skin. We use a lot of it, and the advantages are you can get huge amounts of it. it it's never scarce. Another advantage is it's not rejected by the body, so it lasts for weeks and weeks. The cells used to create transite come from the foreskin of babies. The product is incredibly expensive, $1,500 per application, which makes it very cost prohibitive. Currently, transite is primarily used on second degree burns. Cadaver skin is used more frequently on both second and third degree burns because it is less expensive to process. With the help of Transite, Mr. Davis's wounds are healing nicely, but he's battling a frustrating case of pneumonia. He remains on paralytic drugs and intubated on a ventilator to assist in his breathing. We got his grafts all done, his burns were all treated two, three weeks ago and all closed and he's been just getting over his pneumonia, so he's one of these patients who's very frustrating. And today we're going to go in and wash uh, those out, clean them up. Because Mr. Davis is intubated, he is unable to cough up the secretions on his own. Dr. Harrell, a pulmonologist, performs a bronchoscopy. What we're using is a flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy that goes through his uh, trach tube. And we're able to instill saline down there and wash uh, mucus plugs out. Go ahead and put more uh, saline down there. What we're seeing down there is really thick mucoid material. Mr. Davis will be given bronchoscopies daily until his lungs clear out. Wash uh, those out. When his lungs are clean, he will be taken off the paralytic drugs. Okay, so, Mr. De Leon, this is going to not feel so good, but let's, let's try, okay? Mr. De Leon, the Filipino national rescued off the coast of San Diego, is fitted with pressure garments. The elastic type material placed on his face and hands will aid in reducing scarring. He's required to wear them 23 hours a day for one year. Although he still looks like he's in bad condition, he is surprising his medical team. Here's a man with 85% burns of his body. He had no intravenous line for three days, but really arrived in remarkably good condition from the Air Force paramedics. 
but he was just very, very sick when he came in. His, his blood cell count was very, very low, and yet he's doing very well. They're almost there. Bingo. We got there again. A low blood cell count is a strong indicator that infection has set in. After months of fighting infections, Mr. De Leon now faces a grueling regime of physical and occupational therapy twice a day, seven days a week. Really, really reach with this hand. Are you going to help? Okay. I'll take it. Reach. The therapists are teaching Mr. De Leon how to strengthen the muscles in his arms and legs after months of laying in bed in one position. Really nice. All right. Just within the past couple weeks, he's been becoming more and more alert and getting stronger and stronger. In the past two weeks, he's been able to start moving and responding whenever you talk to him, which is a really, really big step for him. Here two days ago was the first time he asked for anything to eat, which was just a huge change from seeing him for so many weeks, unable to move, unable to communicate. So God love him, he's doing great. Today he's going to be able to sit up in a chair for the first time. There you go. The one hour a day he's allowed to take off his pressure garments is a perfect time for Mr. De Leon to attempt to sit up after laying in bed for nearly two months. It is a big step in his recovery process. Is that better? Is that better? Mr. De Leon, Good. Ken Davis, and Paul Granger all appear to be out of harm's way, but they have a long road ahead of them. Uh, Even after they are released from UCSD's regional burn center, they face months, perhaps years, of physical therapy and pain. Bed settings, SIV 45%. As we follow their progress, we look at their future. Most of the patients will visit the UCSD Regional Burn Center Outpatient Clinic, where in two quick hours, doctors and nurses brainstorm to solve patients' continuing physical problems. It's not gonna feel... But perhaps the most difficult aspect of burn recovery is dealing with the reactions and stares from people on the street. Yeah, and then my legs a little bit right here. After being released from UCSD's burn center, survivors have ongoing medical needs that will require long-term care. Well, Thursday afternoon is our uh, long-term follow-up clinic. We, we see patients uh, for pressure garments to see how their therapy is going. We look at all their problems. They may have local skin problems. We may see them for years after the injury. It's a very important part of what, what we do. I, I tend to be a little more aggressive, and so I use the moisturizer a few times a day. Burn survivor Doug Spencer is here at the clinic today to visit Dr. Tenenhaus. It happened last May, almost a year ago. Um, I struck power lines with a hot air balloon, high tension lines. Uh, one of the tanks exploded. I got third degree burns on my hands, my forehead and side of the head. After nearly a year of painful rehabilitation, Doug is making incredible progress and has begun to appreciate his life as a burn survivor. Rode my bike yesterday. <laughs> it was actually easier than walking. How many hours a day do you think you're wearing them now? Probably like eight. Eight. So Kenny Mickelson, who was nearly killed when the car he was driving flipped over the highway and caught on fire three months ago, has returned to the clinic and is learning about pressure garments the hard way. Wearing pressure garments 23 hours a day is difficult, but very necessary to reduce the severity of scarring. Wearing your pressure garments? Not as much as I should. Come on, yeah. why not? Uh, they hurt. They're like tight. Yeah, it was really important to wear them to oh, control really that, that uh, scar. It's not fun to wear pressure garments around town all summer when it's hot. I mean, the garments are hot, but we know that they have a much better outcome if they wear the pressure garments. 7 p.m. every third Wednesday of the month, the Burn Survivor Support Group meets. The group is open to burn survivors and their family members. The Burn Center staff frequently attend meetings as well. 
we're going to have a round table. So if we can start out with Lori, you want to start out and sure. tell us a little bit about you. Hi, my name is Lori Peterson. Um, I am a burn survivor and I'm also a I'm volunteer at the burn unit. And so I'm here to help in any way that I can on things that I've dealt with. Group members also give a push to survivors that need it. I'm starting to wear the pants, but they're tight and they're like, they're like, you know, I'm not used to wearing nylon, so it's, it's, just, it's a different feeling, but. As long as you don't put that tutu on, it's yeah, going to be okay. Yeah. So I, did, I just, you know, I'm starting to wear them a lot more because I don't, I don't want to, you know, get the scars to get too out of control. These. Yeah. Those are all yeah, grabs. I you would have it there. You couldn't even tell. Mm -hmm. Wear your garments and that's what you get. Another frequent topic of conversation is learning how to deal with staring from strangers. Discussing it at the group helps lessen the sting of comments and questions from others about their appearance. And it really is that way. But I have one situation when I was young in my burn, I was not even quite two years. We moved out of an apartment and I went back to get the mail at night and their son answered the door. He couldn't have been six or seven. And um, I scared him. I think the staring is something that um, people have to overall learn to accept that the burns do make you look different. There's no two ways about it and you've got to accept that reality. I choose to believe that people don't stare because they're malicious but they're staring because they're curious and I think I was always taught that as a small child that people just want to know what happened. It isn't that they're necessarily mean. I think if you can learn to accept who you are in spite of your physical differences and learn to like who you are and hold your head high and be proud of who you are, then people can stare. You have to be comfortable with your own body and who you are to go on in life. And I just think that life's too short not to just enjoy what you've got and who you are and make the best of it. This program contains some actual surgical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Many patients return to the UCSD Burn Center to visit with those who helped save their lives. As Battalion Chief of the San Diego Fire Department, Tony Pollard has a tremendous amount of respect for the work done at the Burn Center. How you doing? <laughs> How are you? But Tony has a very personal connection to the burn center. Three years ago, Tony nearly lost his arm in an accident on his day off. On September 23rd, 1998, Tony was enjoying a rare day off from his firefighting duties and working on an old car that was sitting in his mother's yard. At the time, the vehicle was parked right here, and there was a, an ordinance. We were instructed to move the vehicle, so we were making an attempt, and my stepdad was inside, and he was gonna go ahead and start it. So as the gas was being poured into the uh, carburetor, and I was pulling away, my stepdad made the final attempt to ignite it, and I guess my arm wasn't far enough back away from the engine compartment, and when he hit the key, that's when everything just kind of ignited. The gasoline ignited with a spark. An explosion threw Tony away from the car. Tony's arm was engulfed in flames and his body was covered in gasoline splattered in the blast. Although as a fireman he'd been teaching people to stop, drop and roll, it was the last thing that Tony wanted to do. I knew I had to keep my arm above my clothes because my clothes were soaked with gasoline. The thought to stop, drop, and roll crossed my mind temporarily, but then I realized that that wouldn't be a smart thing to do because the rest of me would catch on fire. Tony yelled to his mother inside the house to call 911, and then, because he didn't want his parents to see him die, he began to run. So I continued this way, I was running. So I got to about this point, and I'd already made up my mind that I'm probably gonna die, so I decided, well, if I do die, I hope I've done everything in my life to go to heaven. And uh, I heard this voice, and it said, stop, I'm not gonna let you die like this. So I turned over here to my left to see who was talking, and there was no one there. Then I turned back around, and then I saw this spigot over here. Tony realized that the garden hose was nearby. He picked it up, turned it on, and put out the fire on his arm. 
The engine company and ambulances arrived and immediately transported Tony to UCSD's burn center. Well, Tony came in and his arm started to swell up like a balloon. And we had to take him down to the operating room and open up the skin or he would have lost his arm. My hand, the skin had just fluffed off completely. So actually, the best way to describe it is after you've had a large size candle, and after that candle is burned down, how the burnt wax or the heated wax begins to layer. And that's exactly what my arm and hand looked like. I couldn't even see my hand because all the skin had just melted off like a candle, and there was this, this skin just hanging there. After two months and three skin grafts, Tony was released from the hospital. Nearly losing his arm gave Tony a unique perspective on being a burn survivor and a firefighter. I've been a firefighter for 23 years now, and for the longest time I figured I'm invincible pretty much. I've been in thousands of fires, but I realized that I wasn't invincible, and I think about it all the time, and, and I don't put my people in a position where they can get injured. Call it medical technology, or call it a triumph of the human spirit, these people are true survivors, not victims. Mr. Granger is still hospitalized, but he is finally breathing on his own. Doctors expect that he'll be going home within a month. After battling pneumonia and making a slow recovery, Ken Davis was taken off the paralytic drugs that placed him in a medically induced coma. He woke up to see his brother Brad and his son Garrett in his room. It is an emotional reunion. Although Mr. Davis still can't speak because of the tubes in his throat, he is able to communicate by hand signals and writing notes on a tablet. One week later, Ken Davis is finally released. Clark Bachelor and James Gomez, two of Mr. De Leon's Coast Guard rescuers who helped save his life, have come to visit him at the hospital. They have brought him a Coast Guard hat and medallion. It is an emotional moment for all. Weeks later, Mr. De Leon was sent home to the Philippines. There, he will stay at a rehabilitation center until he is well enough to return home to his family. He faces several years of difficult recovery, and his scarring may be extensive. Amy Rusticus is having a good time playing with her toys at home with her family. Her skin graft has healed nicely, but she faces years of physical therapy to help undo the damage of her electrical burn. Doctors hope she'll eventually gain full use of her hand and thumb. And Tony Pollard is forever indebted to the UCSD Burn Center staff. They saved his right arm, allowing him to go back to work in his beloved career as a firefighter. Burn unit staff, they're just a, an incredible, unique group of individuals. God, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And I, you know, without them, not just me, but anyone else that uh, suffers burns comes up to this unit. I mean, we wouldn't survive without them. Obviously, the work of these doctors and the science involved is just beyond whatever I could imagine. God is obviously involved very deeply in all of this. To be able to use the skill of these people and the resources that the burn victim brings to this equation. Obviously, the technology plays a large part in what we can do for them, but I also believe that there's a will or an inner strength that some people have and some don't, a spirit that's there that um, people are determined, and you sometimes can just feel that. You can't work on a service like this very long without seeing some miracles or some unbelievable uh, recoveries occur. We've had people who were 85% burned that were probably on death's door 13, 14 times at least during their stay and somehow they were able to make it through. This is what happens when science and the human spirit work hand in hand. 
Up next, science, technology, medicine. Get this week's latest headlines on Discovery News and be an online detective. Identify our mystery guest. Play someone in time only at discovery.com.